very happy to present our highlights of Asian American Pacific Islander scientists uh, hosted by the Department of Material Science and Engineering. This is our second session on May 28th, and we're very much looking forward to a few different highlights uh, today. So I have the honor of kicking things off with Professor Ho Jong Kim, who's an Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering at Penn State. Um, he got his Bachelor's of Science in Material Science Engineering from Seoul National University, and then a PhD in the same field from MIT, and worked at Samsung Corning for five years uh, before returning to a postdoc and then as a faculty member at Penn State. He's an expert in electrochemistry and has um, done some very nice work on the applications of electrochemistry for energy storage, as well as for corrosion resistant materials, and some really interesting work on resource extraction and recycling, again, through an electrochemical approach. So let me show you just a couple snapshots or highlights of uh, Ho Jung's very nice work. These are two papers that I found pretty compelling from his work uh, in the past. One is a pretty recent one that came out last year, this paper here on the electrochemical separation of alkaline, alkaline earth metals from molten salts using liquid metal electrodes. And so what he found is basically that you can use this um, electrochemical cell that uses liquid metal electrodes with higher temperatures to be able to recover alkaline earth um, materials from um, molten salts. And so why is this important? Because it turns out that in many cases, these alkaline earths can be fission products from nuclear reactions. And so what he showed is basically that you could then use this electrochemical approach to be able to recover these, to separate these out from the electrolyte. And so that's really important for handling things like nuclear waste to enable uh, you know, a more sustainable approach for nuclear energy, right? And it's kind of uh, an important, it could be a very important methodology for able to enable resource recovery um, in, in that type of energy production application. Another paper that I found quite interesting is this one on using electromotive force measurements to map phase diagrams. Because in that case, basically you can use these types of measurements, again, through this electrochemical approach to basically be able to uh, map out phase diagrams by directly mapping out what the Gibbs excess energy is, what activity uh, values are for different species and, and different, for example, in this case, um, salt mixtures, right, or, or alloys. And so, for example, in this case, he demonstrated that he could make a very accurate phase diagram of barium bismuth and even identify new phases of barium bismuth at very specific compositions that otherwise you just can't do using other approaches. And so he's essentially a leader in using electrochemistry to be able to develop the phase behavior of some of these molten salts. And these are important, again, for either some, some of these electrochemical systems that he's designing, for example, for resource recovery, um, plus other types of um, you know, metal applications. And so this is just a couple snapshots of the work that Ho Jong's group has done over the years. Um, he's published in papers like Nature, Nature Communications, et cetera, et cetera. He's, on, he's essentially a leader of using electrochemistry for these types of applications. And it's really my pleasure to highlight him today. So with that, let me turn it over to Ryan Fair for his highlight. Ryan, it's all yours. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I wanna thank everybody for being here. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about American born astronaut, Ellison Onizuka. So Onizuka was born just after World War II in 1946 in uh, one of the islands of Hawaii. I'm not gonna do it disservice by trying to pronounce that. Um, am I able to click next or? Do it for oh, you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so from there, he graduated with both his bachelor's and master's in just five years in aerospace engineering from University of Colorado in Boulder in 69. And 69 was actually a big year for Ellison. Not only did he graduate with two degrees, uh, but he also married his wife and they had their first daughter together that year. So must have been quite a banner year for the guy. Um, from there, he joined the U.S. Air Force in 1970, shortly after, uh, where he rose to the rank of colonel, and he worked in the USAF test pilot program, where he trained other young test pilots, and he also worked as an engineer in the test pilot school. Uh, he continued his work in the Air Force for eight years until he was recruited by NASA. Um, next... Thank you. Uh, where he was recruited by NASA for astronaut training. And after receiving his training, uh, he was a part of several successful spaceflight missions where he spent a cumulative 
um, just over three days of time in space. And that actually made him the first person of Japanese descent to enter space, which is a pretty big accomplishment. Now, unfortunately, his life was tragically cut short in 1986 in the Challenger disaster. Um, but I don't want to focus too much on that frustrating and terrible day in U.S. history. Instead, I'd rather focus on the legacy that Onizuka left behind and the way that he's still remembered today. So Onizuka was a member of many communities that respected him a great deal, and they demonstrate this respect in the ways that they continue to honor him. Uh, the Air Force um, honors him uh, for his service by naming the Onizuka Air Force Station in Sunnyvale, California after him. Uh, additionally, those in uh, the Japanese American community must have a great deal of respect for the way that he represented their community um, because there's actually a Onizuka, Onizuka Street in uh, Little Tokyo in LA. Additionally, I wasn't able to find a picture to accompany this, um, but there's also an Onizuka Street actually in Houston, um, just outside the elementary school where his uh, daughters were still attending elementary school um, when he tragically passed away. So, you know, I, I can't imagine the um, terrible loss that his family was facing, but to have the community come together and honor him like that uh, must have been some source of solace for them. Uh, additionally, those in the stargazing community uh, respect and honor him by naming a few celestial bodies after him, including an asteroid and the Onizuka lunar impact crater on the moon. Uh, and then finally, or not finally, but additionally, the uh, Air Force honored him, honors him with the Onizuka Prop Wash Award, which I think it's an award um, given in the test pilot school annually to uh, whatever member of the academy demonstrates the highest level of spirit and enthusiasm for the program. And I have to imagine that naming such an award after Onizuka probably says a great deal about the kind of man he carried himself as. He was probably very enthusiastic and inspiring and um, just a kind person to be around from all accounts that I can find. Uh, and then the final way that I'd like to highlight and that, that he's honored uh, are the annual science education days held at a few different universities around the country in Onizuka's honor. And I think it, it's tragic that he was taken from us still relatively young, but I think that the best way to honor him is to try and inspire and motivate young people to accomplish some of the things that he did and some of the things that he wasn't able to accomplish in his lifetime. And we can do that by inspiring them in the ways that he was inspired. And with that, I'd like to just leave it off on a quote by Onizuka. Uh, he said, make your life count and the world will be a better place because you try. And I think that last part, because you try is really important because even when we do come up short, we're not able to achieve everything that we want to achieve better place because we tried so thank you um thank you very much ryan for the very nice uh, highlight of onizuka next up we have wes reinhardt yes it's my pleasure to uh highlight our very own uh Zikwe lu who's a distinguished professor and holds the inaugural uh dorothy pate enright professorship uh in our department and so um Zikwe was educated in China um, for his bachelor's and, and master's degrees um, and did his PhD in Sweden, um, doing some experimental and theoretical uh, metallurgy experiments. Um, he went to University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, worked at uh, Questech Innovations as a senior research scientist before joining uh, Penn State in 1999. And Zikwe has uh, really been a, a visionary and a leader um, in the field. And so he coined the name uh, Materials Genome and his company holds that trademark um, since 2002. And so, uh, you know, Materials Genome Initiative has been very influential um, in the last decade or so. Uh, and so he was almost a decade ahead of that. Um, and so um, I also wanna point out that he has had a broad influence and, and his work uh, is important to a lot of different fields. And so I put down here that he has current funding from uh, NASA, DOE, a couple different DOE branches, um, ONR and NSF. So he's, 
his work has influenced um, a lot of different uh, application areas. Um, and of course, uh, he's very decorated. He has many honors and awards, um, uh, including the J. Willard Gibbs Phase Equilibria Award from ASM, uh, William Hume Rothery Award from TMS, um, uh, Spriggs Phase Equilibria Award from American Ceramic Society, and Lee Sun uh, Lecture Award from Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Metal Research, um, I'm sure among, among others. Um, he's editor-in-chief of the CalFAD Journal, and he's uh, served on a number of you know, high-profile uh, board positions, and he was also the president of ASM International. Um, next slide. So Zikwe's work um, focuses on modeling and design for a wide range of materials chemistry and processing. And uh, notably um, in this graphic from his website, um, they use first principles calculation, statistical mechanics, um, and they, they kind of go up the length scales uh, to this CalFAD modeling and, and actually consider applications and processes where these uh, material chemistries would be deployed. Um, and so I think that's part of the, uh, you know, influence that he's had is um, the ability to uh, take these theoretical, you know, first principles type uh, approaches and really consider how they're going to be deployed um, to make uh, impactful uh, scientific discoveries. Um, so I pulled a couple of papers here um, from Google Scholar that were highly cited. Um, and one thing that I want to point out that uh, Zikwe actually mentioned is um, the first authors of these uh, two papers in the middle, uh, Yi Wang and Xunli Shang, are um, research faculty in his group. And he said uh, that the former associate dean for research, Alan Scaroni, used to say that uh, they're his uh, left and right arms. And so I think this is a really uh, important comment on Zikwe's uh, humility and, and like team spirit. Um, he's a very uh, kind person, a great leader. Um, uh, he really focuses on, you know, education and um, making sure that he can kind of bring other people along uh, on the scientific journey. Um, and so I have the picture there of his group. He has quite a large group. He's educated a, a lot of different students. Um, he's written a textbook on computational thermodynamics. Um, he holds workshops um, and, you know, publishes their code open source uh, and is really, you know, a dedicated educator in addition to being a scientific visionary. Um, and also on the bottom left, I wanted to comment, um, I've personally uh, been working with him on a project uh, and I think that he's really demonstrated uh, this visionary spirit trying to integrate all sorts of different techniques um, conventional like DFT type stuff, but also uh, big data mining and machine learning. And um, I've really learned a lot from working with him. Thank you, Wes, for the very nice highlight of Shikui. Next up, we have um, Jorge uh, Pasodan Palma. Uh, Jorge, so yours. Hello, yes. So I would like to also uh, talk about one of our own as well, uh, Dr. Yi Wang, who was born in the Heilongjiang uh, province of China, which is the northernmost and easternmost uh, province in the whole country. And, uh, <clears throat> and as you can see, there's a little map on the right to uh, show where that is. And this uh, other figure on the picture on the right is of him as a stunning young man. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, well, some of his life hobbies were the uh, board games of Go and Contract Bridge, which already showed his uh, interest and fascination with, uh, you know, the statistical and uh, abstract thought, mathematical thought, which uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, showed uh, his passion for uh, joining the field of, of, com of computational uh, chemistry and science. And uh, later on, uh, other hobbies of his were, of course, uh, learning how to uh, program, which definitely played a uh, large role in his current career, and also fishing, you know. And uh, with, uh, <clears throat> he was also inspired to pursue physics by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And he obtained his uh, BS and PhD in physical chemistry from the Jilin University. And, then, uh, and then that wasn't enough for him, so he obtained a second degree 
in material science from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Um, next slide. So um, his research interests uh, are revolve around uh, phase stability and thermodynamics. And uh, on the first image on the right, you see uh, he one of one of one of the phenomenal uh, works that he's done is on predicting the critical point uh, through density functional theory and the partition function and describing uh, this uh, structural transition from non magnetic uh, cerium to uh, magnetic cerium. And as you can see in this temperature of, uh, volume uh, phase diagram, you in fact see uh, the critical point and the missing that forms. And it's very exciting that he was able to uh, predict that through computational means. Uh, he also has shown interest in temperature dependence of elasticity in uh, materials, specifically uh, metal alloys. Uh, phonon behavior in crystalline materials. And also uh, on the bottom right figure, you'll see uh, <coughs> uh, phonon um, dispersion curve over uh, <coughs> the uh, wave, uh, wave vector uh, uh, axis. And you will see that uh, his mixed space approach regarding phonons in polar materials is what he was able to do. Uh, he's able to better describe um, materials that are polar or have dipole moments uh, with his uh, mixed space approach, which is another exciting contribution he's made to material science. Um, next uh, slide. But also he's uh, not just a researcher, but he's, you know, has many academic contributions, uh, has developed, uh, has you know, been an informal advisor to seven graduate students, has taught uh, MATSI 580 from 2009 to 2020 and uh, here at Penn, uh, Penn State specifically lectures on density functional theory. He's also been the master representative for fixed term and research faculty committee. Uh, as you can see on the bottom uh, left figure, he was a co-author in Dr. Lou Sigwig, who uh, uh, Dr. Reinhardt just introduced. Uh, he was a co-author in the Computational Thermodynamics of Materials book. And uh, personally, he's also been a phenomenal mentor to me and he's taught me a lot through the years. So I would like to uh, highlight, I'm honored to highlight uh, Dr. Yi Wang in this presentation. Many thanks, Jorge, for such a nice highlight of uh, Yi. Next up, we have Hong Yong Kim. Yes. <clears throat> it is my great pleasure to highlight Dr. Shun Yi Chen. I think I can highlight every single point of him, but I would like to highlight as much as I can. I, I, I know and also how I felt during, during working, in, working with him for the last six years. Uh, Shunni is a very active person, and I mean, he's not only an active researcher, but also physically active person. He sometimes introduced some hiking, hiking places or some good scenery photos, and he knows a lot of good places for picnic or hiking. And let's go back to his <coughs> his background. And he has his back the bachelor degree in Shenyang Institute of Technology and his master's from Xi'an Jiangtong University, and his PhD degree is from General Research Institute Institute for Feder Federal Metals. And after receiving his PhD, he, he has worked in Delft University of Technology for five years. Then finally, he came to Penn State in 2005. And up to now, it has been like 16 years. Uh, 16 years, he has been working with, with Dr. Zikuru. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> during this period of time, like 16 years, at Penn State, he has published more than 270 papers and with over 8,000 citations. And he devoted many thermodynamic scripts such as elastic properties and divine models, which is, which, <coughs> which is very fundamental in thermodynamic calculations. And he also, he also, He's also a good mentor to me and also other, other graduate students. <clears throat> and especially for me, I remember that whenever I visit, 
visit him for asking some advices. He directs me to come up with some possible solutions or directions almost always. And I would like to mention that he has a lot of collaborators and this is one of the reasons that he has a lot of, a lot of papers and his research interests interest are not limited to the thermodynamic study of bulk, mat bulk materials and he extends his research scope to 2D materials and also thermodynamic methodology study and recently machine learning approaches. And I would like to highlight some of his work. And one of the one of one example is the thermodynamic modeling of two-dimensional layered transition metal dichroxenized denized. <clears throat> and this employs the um, integrated density functional theory and carpet modeling approaches to provide thermodynamic insights into retro versus like vertical growth of 2D materials such as uh, MOS2. And also one other, another, another example of his work is uh, he has uh, one of his work helps the suitability of binary oxide for molecular beam epitaxy growth source materials from the uh, comprehensive thermodynamic analysis. And recently his research extends to machine learning and one of his work is, is the second fault energy from first principle calculation. And he correlated these properties with uh, the materials fundamental descriptors and rank them and, and analyze the descriptors by ranking which descriptors influence the, this property the most. And as I mentioned that <clears throat> he, he is very active person and it's, it's my pleasure to highlight him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hongyang, for this very nice um, highlight of Xunli. All right, next up we have Haley Young. Thank you. Um, so today I'd like to highlight Dr. Pim Chai Chai Yen. Um, she did get her bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Prince of Sangkla University in Thailand. And then she went on to get her PhD in biological chemistry from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 1997. Very soon after that, she started her teaching career at Mahidon University in 1997. Um, and while she was there, she worked through um, a series of professor positions. I fortunately uh, studied abroad at Mahidon University in 2017. Um, I never got to meet Dr. Chayan, but the students did speak very highly of her um, and she's a well-loved advisor there. Then she then went on to become a professor and a dean at Vistec, um, also in Thailand, and recently took a position as an associate editor with ACS Catalysis. Uh, Dr. Chayan has very many awards and distinctions. I've listed a few of the notable ones here. Um, early in her career in 2003, she got the L'Oreal UNESCO Fellowship for Women um, in Science in Thailand and then soon after got the Young Scientist Award. Um, in 2015, she did give a TEDx talk in Bangkok, Thailand, um, and it was titled Developing Yourself with Scientific Thinking. So um, I think that really highlights her um, thought that science is for everybody, um, not just the scientific community, but for a general audience as well. And then she was highlighted um, in the more recent years as an outstanding scientist of Thailand and then in the division of protein science as well. And the next slide. So Dr. Chayen, um, her research does focus on enzyme catalysis and metabolic engineering for green chemistry. Um, her research really encompasses a mix of biochemistry and then physical chemistry and organic chemistry. So her group works to understand the reaction mechanisms of different redox and autolase enzymes. And this work contributes to the knowledge of green biocatalysts um, that are used to synthesize specialty compounds that go in food. Her group also um, has uh, dived into the biodetection world. 
So they use uh, luciferases that um, are compounds that can emit light. Um, so they can be linked for the detection of specific molecules like genes that are present uh, or related to diseases or pesticides that can contaminate the environment and food as well. And her work, um, she has filed up to, I think, 25 patents. Um, and it led into one of her first startups called Smart or Smart Biotech. And that company uh, uses these luciferases um, as biomarkers. So that company ends up being the first domestic biomarker company in Thailand. Her second startup um, was called Biosyn Thai. And this uh, company works to include um, sustainable energy practices in real life. Um, so for instance, these pictures at the bottom are showing her work to develop a comprehensive and really sustainable waste management pilot program um, in some of the provinces of Thailand. So she really does um, put action or science in action, um, which I think is really remarkable. And then uh, her work has made such a profound impact that um, she is involved in policy activism. So she's a meta, uh, member of a committee for the green economy policy in the Thai government. So she makes scientific um, advice for that committee. And then she's also an executive board member at the National Science and Technology Development Agency. So with that, um, I was proud to uh, highlight Dr. Pim Chai Chayan. Thank you very much, Haley, for that very nice highlight of Pim Chai. Next up, we have Todd Palmer. Todd, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Enrique. I wanted to talk a little bit uh, this morning about uh, Professor DeBroy. And so I, I can't take credit for the nice slides that'll show up uh, afterwards. One of my uh, academic brothers, Wei Zhang, had put these together to nominate Professor DeBroy for an award. And they fit in well with uh, the tone and sort of uh, theme for what we're doing today. Um, I guess we can start at the beginning with uh, Professor DeBroy. He grew up in uh, Calcutta. And so I'm used to the older spelling of it or the others, the uh, anglicized spelling of it anyway. And uh, graduated with his PhD from uh, Indian Institute of Science in, in Bangalore. And so under uh, KP Abraham. And you'll notice even into his postdoc at Imperial College in London, uh, he was really a steel guy early on. And he really did a lot of fairly seminal work. And I would say seminal, take away the fairly, but seminal work in the, the modeling of steelmaking processes. Um, we tend to uh, maybe look down upon those a little bit now, but I think you're all going, everybody's going to find out how important they actually are here in the uh, upcoming years. Um, and when he, he moved on to, to MIT as a research associate and worked for a, a couple real giants, both in welding and in numerical modeling of materials processes in, in Tom Eager and um, in Julian Zakelli. And uh, with my uh, interests in, in welding and joining, I think this is really where Professor DeBroy started to develop his and with his longstanding uh, collaborations with Stan David at Oak Ridge to really move into uh, the welding field. And I'll, I'll quote Tom Eager here a little bit, or at least paraphrase uh, Tom. He's, he's fairly famous for saying physicists don't want to study arc welding because arc welding is too hard. And so Professor DeBroy sort of took that uh, challenge, I think, and um, really what we'll show is, is, you know, with over 50 group members and collaborators worldwide, if you go to the next slide, we'll show a little bit of, of that, of what he has done as far as his work. Now, there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of this uh, looking at it, but really most of, a lot of what you see here really covers about everything we talk about in uh, material science and, and manufacturing. And in welding and joining, all of that is happening really within about two or three millimeters. So the entire steel mill, as I would say, when I when I was taking class, when I was an undergraduate here, and uh, Professor Cuddy would would talk about physical metallurgy, these were the types of things that he said. Is and, and I remember Professor Cuddy even saying that uh, uh, the best way to ruin a perfectly good piece of metal was to weld it. And so Professor De has spent a uh, really a career 
looking at how to get around some of these issues. So we're ruining these perfectly good pieces of metal. And if you think about it, even the grain growth in Thai 6-4, hours and hours had been spent making that plate of Thai 6-4. We're going to make a weld on it and ruin everything that, that we've done and all those, uh, like all those thermomechanical processes. Additive manufacturing is, is much the same way. So these are extremely complex uh, processes that Professor De Broglie's modeling work has really helped to illuminate. And within the welding community, I, I can't stress where Professor De Broglie sits. If there were a Mount Rushmore of the 20th century welding community, he would be on there. Um, really just from his work in the modeling and understanding of heat transfer and fluid flow, um, you know, from all of these processes. Um, so you go to the next slide. Um, talked a little bit about, you know, what he has done and sort of his impact, um, you know, for a welder to have an H index of, of 78 and have over 23,000 citations is, is really unheard of. Um, he is really at the top, probably the most cited uh, welding researcher in the world. Um, really, you know, especially even in additive manufacturing now, because, uh, really additive manufacturing is not really much more than just welding uh, at the end of the day. And so a lot of what the groundwork he's laid is now being applied in, in additive manufacturing. And he's, he's also started to, to branch out a little more into uh, really that sort of public access and that, that role of uh, the scientist as, as the honest broker, as, as Roger Pelkey has written about. Um, with the new book he's authored with, and I, that is correct, is Sir Harry Badesha, one of those uh, Ferris physical metallurgists who actually has been knighted by the Queen um, in Britain. So he's worked with uh, Sir Harry for a number of years as, as well um, in, in a lot of these areas. And we can see the selected awards. And he just was recently given um, uh, a number of different awards. He's been highly honored by the American Welding Society, International Institute of Welding, um, ASM International, the, the Royal Academy. And one of the other things he's done that would put him up there on sort of that Mount Rushmore of welding engineers is really his work with Stan David and, and Sir Harry on the science and technology of welding and joining, which is a journal that he was a founding editor of and is really sort of one of the uh, ground sort of fundamental journals now within the, the welding and joining community. And you can see everywhere else he, is, he has been. So um, he's sort of uh, been and done just about everything you can as far as that. And I, I don't want to say even here at Penn State, he, he won a faculty scholar medal. And I can remember the day I remember if anybody remembers Dick Tressler, I remember Dick Tressler walking down the hall looking for him. I ran in, into him and, and he basically had said yes, that Professor DeBoer had won the Faculty Scholar Medal back in, in the uh, mid 90s. So um, go to the next slide. Um, sort of a, a little bit of an idea of who he's, he's affected. And I, I will say it's uh, really a large number of highly successful people. I'm not sure about the, the one in third row down in the first column, but really sort of the head of the class is Tom Zachariah. Um, he's director at Oak Ridge National Lab. And if you've been, you met Tom. Uh, Tom has done a, a world of great things, but he was, he was postdoc in, in Professor DeBroy's group and, and really at the beginning wrote some of those real seminal papers on really laying the groundwork for modeling and numerical modeling of heat transfer and fluid flow and welding. Um, Kanishka Tonkala, not a welder, uh, diamond thin film growth. And so we can go on. Uday Paul, a uh, great guy up at uh, Boston University, really the uh, really a steel making guy. My brother Wei Zhang at, at Ohio State and a range of other uh, people, even Brandon Ribick at America Makes. And so mm. Professor DeBroy definitely has had an outsized uh, impact on uh, the world of welding. And really, since welding impacts everything, he's had an, uh, an outsized impact uh, probably across a lot of things that we don't really think about. So I think that's all I have, Enrique. Thank you very much, Todd, for the very nice highlight, Tara Sankar. All right. Next up, we have Chen Su Han. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Can you hear? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I am Chan Su Han. Uh, I take a uh, pleasure to introduce and highlight the research of Lam Wan Sri Ram Das. Uh, Lam is my colleague and a good friend of mine. Uh, Lam is from India. He received his bachelor degree from JNT University in Hyderabad. He's from the same place, Hyderabad, that is famous for the monument Chamina. He received uh, MS and PhD degrees from the Indian Institute of Science in India. Uh, before pursuing his uh, doctoral studies, uh, Lam worked in the uh, Indian uh, Space Research Organization during 2006 and 2011. Uh, Lam has been working in Dr. Priya's group as a postdoctoral researcher at Virginia Tech during 2017 and 2018 and as an uh, assistant research professor at Penn State from uh, 2018. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? Okay. Uh, during his employment in the aerospace industry, he had an opportunity, opportunity to learn about inertial navigation systems used in uh, Indian launch vehicles. Uh, Lam contributed to the uh, vibration analysis and uh, quality assurance of inertial sensors for Indian launch vehicles and created uh, novel automation tools for inspection and uh, sensor yield enhancement. Uh, his strong passion for electromechanical systems uh, motivate him to pursue uh, MS and PhD degrees from the well distinguished Indian Institute of uh, Science uh, in Bangalore under the uh, mentorship of Professor Rudra uh, Pratham. Uh, during, oh, sorry. during his PhD, uh, Lam proposed a multi-step piezoelectric vibration energy harvester to enhance the power uh, compared with conventional unimorph or bimorphs. He also proposed a scaling analysis uh, for MAMS vibration harvesters that helps in predicting the harvester performance using SPS five factors. Uh, he received the top 50 most downloaded paper award from the IEEE Sensor Councils for his article in 2015. Uh, Lam proposed uh, lumped circuit models for a hybrid electrodynamic and piezoelectric harvester. During his postdoctoral career at Virginia Tech, he contributed to the design of broadband and magnetic field field at harvester modeling and uh, backpack energy harvester efficiency analysis. Uh, Lam has contributed to the design of a model at Noble Magneto Electric Harvester using distributed processing architecture to generate greater power at the same frequency. Uh, he has also uh, derived a summer acoustic model that provides the equivalence of uh, fresher wave and summer wave wave summer wave-based uh, sound generation. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? Uh, Lam is developing the bio-inspired robot for health uh, monitoring in cattle. Uh, he was able to successfully uh, implement an untethered unted robot um, mimicking a capital gate to collect and send data wirelessly. Uh, Lam is a, a strong believer that uh, in a Disciplinary education enables one to competently contribute to the uh, grand challenges uh, confronted in autonomous robotics and smart uh, structure fields. Uh, Lam is also always motivated to uh, design and model electromechanical multidisciplinary systems and strongly support uh, in it, interdisciplinary education. Uh, I personally know him as a humble and dedicated engineering researcher and wish him all the best. Uh, that's what I have. Thank you very much for this um, very nice highlight of Ramohan. Next up, we have Lu Yao Zeng. Okay, thank you. So good morning, everyone. This is Lu Yao. It's my pleasure to highlight my colleague, Dr. Dong Yang. So he is now an assistant professor, research professor in Penn State and uh, um, now it's like he's managed the solo module application and like kind of 
characterization facilities in this in the energy environment lab. So he earned his PhD from uh, Dali Institute of Chemical and Physics in 2014, and then he moved to like uh, moved to Sanxi Normal University as a postdoc. And at that time, his research is focused on the perovskite solo cells, and he make uh, he made a lot of uh, great contribution to this field during that time. And uh, later on, he joined Dr. Uh, Priya's group in 2017 and moved to Penn State um, in 2018 and to the present. So now his research interest focused on some uh, flexible solution modules and uh, has also has some very great uh, progress in this field. So he is very um, active and understanding researchers. He's very young and uh, now he already have like over 170 uh, published journals and with very uh, high citation numbers. And uh, as, uh, as a father of two child, uh, uh, he is uh, really good at cooking. So usually he will invite, invite us to his home to make some very good food, food in the festivals. And uh, Let's back to his research research field, and uh, he has a lot of like great contributions to the field of perovskite solo cells. So here I just select uh, four topics uh, of his uh, uh, researches. So first is uh, the some like advanced surface optimization to improve the efficiency of the device, and also they and also he uh, developed some very um, good flexible modules based on some uh, solid state uh, liquid ionic uh, materials. And also uh, he is able to make a record power conversion efficiency of this device in the world back to that time. And uh, recently he developed some um, transparent uh, uh, electrode, which helps to uh, demonstrate this uh, tenant solutions, which has very high efficiency in this field. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? So here's the highlights of his research. So first, uh, first uh, typical work is to optimize the surface of this uh, tin oxide, uh, titanium oxide uh, electron transport layer. So he used some uh, liquid, uh, ionic liquid to improve the mobility and uh, uh, charge transfer properties in these uh, uh, layers. And they get, he got very good uh, device performance uh, from this uh, optimization, and which record which which reaches the uh, record data back to 2000, 2016. And later on, he came out with this idea: use some solid state uh, uh, ionic liquid to replace this uh, rigid uh, layers like titanium oxide. So then they can they they can able to make they are able to make this flexible module. You can see from the pictures. So this device can like, can probably can like place onto the clothes because it's flexible and it has very high uh, power conversion efficiency. It's about like 16 percentage. It's also the record back to that time. And uh, another work I would like to highlight is uh, uh, this, uh, another like surface modification, but it's more advanced. So here they use uh, uh, tin oxide rather than titanium oxide because it's highly uh, conductive compared to the titanium oxide. And uh, by using this uh, EETA uh, molecules to, um, to optimize the surface property of these uh, layers, they're able to get very high efficiency, like over 20 percentage of power conversion efficiency. And, and most importantly, this, uh, by this uh, modification, the device has a very good stability comparing to the uh, previous uh, uh, pristine devices. They can uh, last like over 3,000 hours, like which can, which, which, which still like remains over 90% of this uh, uh, initial power conversion efficiency. And uh, another recent work uh, uh, of Jones is this uh, tendency solutions. So he used some uh, very technical method to um, 
uh, to like realize this uh, uniform distributed uh, uh, goals in film and it's make it very thin and transparent. So later on, they can able to uh, he can he is able to make this uh, uh, transparent uh, semi transparent top seal as shown here. So the top seal is a perovskite material and it can absorb the UV and the visible and a, a part of the IR a light to convert it to electricity. And then the bottom seal is a silicon based solar seal, which can which uh, which uh, can harvest the energy from the uh, infrared light. So by constructing these two cells together, so uh, they can able to like, they are able to harvesting all the very wide uh, brand of this uh, solar, uh, solar energy from, uh, vis from UV visible to near yeah, infrared range. So and it can provide very high power conversion, com com power conversion efficiency. It's close to, it's over like 28 percentage. It's a uh, huge uh, achievements in this field. Um, based on Don's research, researches, so we are we are able to like make these flexible uh, solar cells which can place on a bed or like uh, uh, even on hat and t-shirt. So we can imagine we can just wear this uh, flexible uh, solar cells in, on um, on this uh, uh, barbless, then we can harvest in, uh, solar energy and can charge our devices easily. So I think that's all I have today. Thank you very much, Julia, for this very nice highlight of Dong. Next up, we have uh, Ha Young Leng. Hi, good morning, everyone. Today, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, give a highlight of um, my uh, one of my lab mate, uh, Wen Jian Li. Um, he is a very um, talented um, guy in um, several, um, several electric materials field. Um, first, let's go to his uh, background. Um, he earned his the PhD degree of material science and engineering from the Technic University uh, Darmstadt, uh, which is one of the well-known university in Germany in, two, uh, in 2015. After that, he uh, he joined in a uh, professor's prayers group as the re assistant research professor at Penn State in 2018. Um, during these almost uh, three years, he, uh, um, he did a lot of good work in thermal electric, materi uh, electric materials and devices. Uh, he can propose some uh, novel device low ideas which can improve the conversion efficiency of the, of the thermal electric modules and also improve the ZT value of the thermal electric materials. Um, besides the researches, he loves uh, traveling and hiking during the vacation with uh, some of his friends and also lab mates. Um, as the researchers in, um, he has already authored and co-authored around uh, 48 journals, which have been cited over 780 times. And also some of the papers um, have a high index. Um, uh, now let's go to uh, his research interest. Uh, first, he uh, focused on designing and synthesizing and characterizing some thermal, uh, high performance thermoelectric materials. Uh, including um, half Hessner's uh, bismuth chloride and noise and oxide ceramics. And also he, he can design and fabricate and test some thermal electric modules, uh, including like the single stage segmented modules. Um, besides the fabricate, fabrication of thermal electric modules, uh, he can also est establish and maintain the thermal electric module test instrument uh, for the contact resistance and conversion efficiency. Yeah, uh, please go to the next page. Um, he's already made uh, great contributions to the thermal electric field. Uh, here is two examples. Uh, the first example is, he's, um, is the work he did in Penn State. 
uh, is a se segmented thermoelectric device architectures, uh, which can be demonstrated in conjunction with the heterogeneous uh, materials integrations. Uh, this, uh, this is the Bismarck's telluride how Hessner segmented thermoelectric uh, Uli cover models. Uh, it can generate uh, the, the water record conversion efficiency around 12% under the temperature difference around uh, 584 Ks. So based on the figure on the right-hand side, we can see this is so far the highest conversion efficiency in the uh, thermal electric models compared to uh, uh, previous works. So this will make a huge uh, contributions to the industry application of the thermal electric materials. The second uh, example is, is the high performance thermal electric materials. So, um, the thermoelectric performance of the uh, eterbiums, um, single field uh, scatter right eyes um, has been successfully um, enhanced by um, decreasing the thermal conductivities. Uh, this decrease, the decreased, this ultra low or decreased thermal conductivities is due to the um, combination of the secondary phase scattering and also fall on. Uh, scattering from the dynamic electron exchange between the ions and the carbons, um, as shown on the, uh, the as shown the figure on the right hand side. So, yeah, that's all I have prepared for. Um, when Jenny's, yes, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Haiyang, for the very nice highlight of Wenji. Yeah. So I have the pleasure to give the last highlight of this session. And my highlight is on Chiang Shusen, who is a mathematician, engineering, and a physicist, and is known as the father of China's space program. Um, he was born in Shanghai. He got his mechanical engineering degree from Shanghai Jiatong University, but then a master's at MIT, and a PhD from Caltech from uh, Von Karman, um, who was essentially uh, the father of the American space program. And he actually started his career at Caltech as a faculty member. And he played a very key role in the inception of the space program in the United States. He was part of a group that was called um, the Suicide Squad, believe it or not, uh, because they were working on propellants, on various experiments on rocketry and so on. So these high explosives. And so people would call them the Suicide Squad because they're working on these dangerous materials. Uh, and it's interesting because as this group was getting together and beginning to kind of form ideas, um, they realized that the mathematics requires to put things into space was very advanced and some of them not necessarily developed. And so that's how they recruited Chan as we become very interested through the because of the math problems. And so essentially he was the, the, the math genius that would come in and, um, and work with them in terms of developing some of the initial concepts. And so he played a very key role in the founding of the, the very famous Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the United States, which played a key role in terms of all of the initial work for advanced rocketry and so on. Um, and, and there's a very nice story about him in, a, uh, in this website down here on the BBC. So here's a nice picture of Susan um, working with uh, uh, Von Karman uh, and Von Karman's advisor, Prandtl, um, uh, here wearing his... Uh, looks like his army fatigues as he was essentially uh, part of the Manhattan Project and, and um, um, kind of inducted into the army, uh, you know, to be able to meet the security clearance and, and so on and so on. So uh, Xi'an played a key role in the development of the American Space Corp Program and, and then eventually uh, went to China and played a key role and developed the space program there. That part of the story, unfortunately, is not quite as happy uh, because he was caught up, unfortunately, in the McCarthy anti-communist uh, movement and basically labeled as a communist and as a consequence was under house arrest for many years and really ostracized by the U.S. government from the community. Now, the scientific community did their best to stand up for him, including faculty uh, members at Caltech, others at other institutions, and even some members of the current Eisenhower, um, at the time of the Eisenhower government, to stand up for Chiang saying he's a natural resource. He essentially was well known as being a mathematical genius, a genius in general, 
and was absolutely key to the development of some of the initial concepts for the space program. So he was an invaluable member um, of that kind of initial group. Nevertheless, at some point, Eisenhower himself decided to deport him to China, um, which by many, not only at the time, was recognized as one of the biggest mistakes the United States had done um, in terms of uh, that approach. And it's also, uh, historians have also um, come out and, and said th things like that. It was a huge mistake by the US government to do such a horrible thing, based essentially on, as an example of how bias can lead to very terrible decisions. But the story turns better because once Xi'an arrived in China, um, the Chinese government, of course, quickly recognized his talents, um, realized his, his capabilities and basically gave him the resources he needed to start a space program there. And now, of course, uh, China is putting you know, rovers on the moon and, and doing all kinds of great work and contributions to science and space and so on. And all of that was born out of his efforts and, and his brilliance and be able to develop that and making contributions not only to China's space program, but in general to our overall knowledge as, you know, as a people of the world and so on. So it has a happy ending in the end. So that concludes our webinar um, on highlighting scientists from Asian American Pacific Islander descent. I'm very much grateful for all of the speakers for our two sessions. And of course, um, for all of their nice efforts in highlighting uh, these various folks. So thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.